Hi there YouTube, it's Sal Good Sam here. This is a comics coloring video mainly intended for my making comics class at Sin Studio and for my Patreon patrons, but um, I'm going to post it to YouTube. Anyone who um, finds it useful is welcomed to do so. Um, I don't color things quite the same way everyone else does, and I think generally speaking uh, a lot of colors over time develop their own idiosyncratic processes. Um, but, uh, I don't think, um, there's really a hard line right or wrong way. This way works well for me. Um, sometimes it's, it's tailored around the kind of art I make, and it's also tailored around the fact that I, I don't like scanning incredibly, uh, and running incredibly huge files. Uh, my computers are not super powerful, so, uh, 1200 uh, DPI bitmap files with, full color and all that tend to cause me problems. Um, I'm also doing a lot of uh, tonal art and then tinting it. So it's it, a lot of my process is tailored around that. So you may not find everything I, I'm going to talk about here useful, uh, but this is how I do it. So initially I'm going to show you uh, four different pages and initially here we're looking at one that I did for gutters, uh, it was a satirical page. Uh, the Continuing Adventures of Two Guys Fighting. Um, this is a part two in a series. And uh, I have here, you can see I've organized my layers. Um, I'm going to turn off the lettering for a second. And it also gets rid of uh, the dressing. So the dressing is things like this page color and these page marks that make it look like a, a comics page. Um, I have it all in one folder so I can just kill it all in one go. So we want to see just the art for this video. Um, now, first thing I'm going to do is show you the line art. This is uh, what I started with. And uh, at one point, I accidentally filled in the no on the art layer, and that's why it's red. Um, ironic that it says no, because that was probably what I was saying when I did it. But I just left it because it was easy to do so. Um, now. This would have been a scan of inked lines, and I generally scan, I generally do washes in my art, but in this case I didn't. So I generally scan my art in a, a grayscale, or actually not grayscale, full color, um, because I want all the grayscales and all the tones and values, and I use an, a light color erase blue or other colors for my penciling and my roughing, and then I have uh, often ink tones, or even here with just the line work. Um, I want to be able to get rid of the color erase, so I, I scan in full color, and then I use uh, um, image adjustment, uh, well, so I need to actually select a layer, there we go, image adjustment, uh, replace color to get rid of uh, the colors in the art. In this case I would have gotten rid of everything but the black line and enhance the blacks to make them nice and black. Um, and then once I have the art like this, some people will scan their work at much higher resolutions and they'll get rid of all the white, so they just have black pixels. Um, I don't like doing this. Um, I don't find it necessary and it makes files that are much too large for my computers generally to handle usually. This new laptop I'm running on could probably pull it off, but in the past my computers have been economical. And uh, they work, but they, they don't handle the 1200 DPI with RGB color or CYMK color very well. So I've gotten to the habit of working around uh, 600 uh, DPI uh, or for print size. So what I actually end up doing is, cause in, especially in this case, I worked a full 60% uh, larger than print. So this is an 11 by 17 sheet, um, uh, which is a classic uh, mainstream American comics format. Uh, so I scanned this at 300 dpi, and if you shrink that down to um, the standard comic book format, that's going to be 600 or more dpi. Um, I also often work in other formats, so I do a lot of my books in 8x10, and then I'll draw them on 11x14, and then scan that at around 600 dpi, and it gives me a surplus of resolution when I shrink it down to the 8x10. And then I'll often work at around three to 400 DPI in terms of the uh, print pixels per inch at print size on my screen. Uh, you only really need 300 DPI for most color printing. So quick uh, explanation as to why people do the 1200 DPI bitmap thing. Um, if we zoom in close, you see these jaggies, right? 
Um, also those little color artifacts, but I don't worry about those too much. Um, I can get rid of them further, but I like to leave a certain amount in because I also means getting rid of them tends to mean losing some of the subtleties of these lines. Um, when people do the bitmap thing, uh, what they're trying to do is get the jaggy so small that uh, at print resolution you don't see them. And that's more of an issue with black and white books that are going to be line art. So if you have black and white line art that's got no gray values and no color in it, often there's no screen involved in the printing. So that means that you will see um, every pixel, so to speak. So you should understand that this comes from a time when we, we stat, uh, took photostats to burn plates of our art. And um, if you had any gray values or color involved, then you introduced a screen. But if you didn't, you were doing pure line and you wanted maximum resolution, which translated to 1200 DPI when you were talking about computers. Um, uh, basically a continuous line as far as the human eye was concerned. But with uh, 400 or 300 DPI even, uh, you get a, a, an anti-aliased line that at print size, the human eye doesn't really notice too well unless you have a side-by-side -side -side comparison. And then once you introduce grayscale, because I do a lot of my ink wash in my work, or color, then there's going to actually be a screen introduced um, to the art. Uh, so the, the cap on any print resolution, unless you're talking about fine art prints, is usually around 300 dpi it's sometimes even lower if you're talking about like say banner prints but for books it's typically about 300 dpi a lot of printers these days won't take files that are even higher than that um so especially with digital printing so um i find that 300 dpi or even we'll often do 400 dpi to have a little surplus and then i want to export it into indesign or whatever um layout program i'm using uh, it will package out and export uh, a print-ready file that is actually 300 dpi, even though I've had some surplus in there. And my surplus resolution just makes sure it's extra sharp. Um, so yeah, uh, that explains the resolution thing. So now I have my, my ready black and white line art. And then I have uh, different layers here handling different colors. And the way I work it is that I have my layers over my ink lines. And... Uh, this one, the screen, is a color hold layer. So what it's doing is turning some of the lines into a color. Color holding is a term, term left over from the, the old days of web printing and photostats. And so things like her eyebrows and the line work on the blood and these things in the logo there. Um, then I have a layer of fills on multiply. And so that's your main fills. I'm using a gradient fill here. So let's for a second take get rid of that, and you can actually see what that looks like. So let me get rid of the screen there. So there's the fills without the line art. And when you add when you add that to the line art, that's adding tone. So this art actually does have a little bit of gradient in it, uh, tones. I had some uh, pencil work, both the intestines here and on that bell. And so that added to all of that. Here you can see the blood with the color hold and the fills. It's very poppy and very bright and uh, that was I was finding that a little bit too garish. I wanted to slightly knock it back so I have a hue saturation layer, layer you can see here and I've slightly desaturated it and slightly shifted the hue. So I turn that on and then I went into overlay and did another layer with that. So quickly, let's go and see that. And you can see what that is, overlay mask. And what I'm doing is sort of unifying certain combinations of the colors, harmonizing it a bit more. I was feeling a little uh, garish. I wanted to, the colors to be bl more blended. And basically, it's about kind of making the colors all get along, matching, as you were, your socks with your shoes. Um, so here we've got um, shadows. So you can see I've added shadows to some things. Again, let's look at that on its own. Just a little there, it's a little there. Not very, not very aggressive. Just a few shadow layers. It's set on multiply, and it's knocked down in the fill to 
And then I have a, an effects layer. So the effects layer, I think for recall mainly is on this guy's face right here. It's some glows. You can see how that works. Do I have it on the one up there? No. So it only appears in that one spot. So that's pretty classic. Um, and then again, overall, just to blend it a little more, I have another hue saturation. So I desaturate it even further, like so. And that gives me my final colors. So then when we reintroduce the lettering again, there's our end result. So that's a pretty classic old school line art coloring job. So the biggest difference is that with the, some people they will put the line art on multiply uh, and put it on top of the stack. Uh, so kind of like this, multiply. But that creates problems, for example, like my, my screen layer will now overlay the color. See, it's affecting both color here, so I have an artifact there. So one of the reasons I put the line work on the bottom of the stack is because I do things like do these color holds. And so that lets my screen layer live underneath my multiply layer and my overlays. Um, and I have less conflicts that way, I find. So that works for me. Uh, your mileage will vary, but uh, that is what I enjoy. Um, so let's gonna save that out because I organized these layers to make it a little easier to explain things. And I want to keep that now because they're nice and organized. So let's close that and look at a very different page. Yes. All right. So this is a page out of my book called Dream Life. And I actually ended up doing this book in black and white. But I spent a bit of time uh, experimenting with about 30 of the pages in color. I was thinking about having dream sequences in color. And then I got carried away and did a whole bunch of the, the waking sequences as well. And then I realized it was going to take just too long. Uh, much too labor intensive. So I did not maintain that plan. Did I do the lettering on the art? I did. Okay, so let's go back down to my original art. So there you can see, this is a situation where my line art is not just line art. It's actually ink washes and inking. And this is how I do a lot of my work. I'll use ink wash or graphite or a combination of those. And I will have tones in my line art. And I have a couple reasons for that. I, first of all, I like doing it in terms of like creating depth and thinking in values. It's, it's sort of more how I think when I'm conceiving the art and uh, building it up. Um, I don't have pictures in my head exactly, but I do think in dimensional space conceptually. Um, and so this is a very natural fit for me. And then what I'm also doing is, so in black and white art, I quite like just this sort of look the ink wash look. Um, and then for the color work, what I thought I would do is I would assign these color values. And in some cases, even like here on a shirt, I would take um, a page out of uh, Impressionist and Post-Impressionist color theory, where the shadows would become tinted the color of the light source. So in this case, we have a window. And uh, that meant that... Uh, we were going to, so here's our window. So I've actually tinted things outside the window, a greenish color. So zoom in. So that's just a simple overlay set to screen. And it's not too tidy, but because there's no, nothing in the background to interfere with it, I didn't have to be tidy. I just wanted to color all the visible bits. So again, over here. And you can see it's not very tidy. There's a little bit of gray showing there, but no one's going to notice. I also think I a Nailed a little bit of yeah, a little bit of red in her face, um, and uh, then I've got another one here. Oh, that's a fill. Sorry, that's not what the one I want. This is the one I want. Here we go. So this is the main uh, tint layer, and so what I've done here. Let's look at this shirt. See how it's blue and purple. 
So I'm thinking that the light source from the window is a blue cast. So I'm using blue and then purple here because I don't want it to all be blue. I want it to co uh, uh, contrast against them. But something in the blue family, in this case a blue-red. Um, and uh, then I've got a so that light layer is set to color. Sometimes I use overlay, overlay, or hue for this effect. So like overlay would look like this. It's a sort of softer effect, and hue would do this, which is an even softer effect. And color is the really strong one. Um, in this case, I wanted a very strong effect, so I used color. And uh, here I've got a multiply layer. So these are the fills that go over top of all of this. So let's take a quick look at it before I go over the fill. Maybe we can see how this is turning out. And notice the, the very kind of royal blue on the jacket. That's a leather jacket. Here in the wood, I'm just using wood on brown on brown. So this is just like a darker wood grain that's going to fill with the lighter brown. Here in the Washington sign, I've added some color. And so yeah, I remember I, I've got this fill here for the Seattle sign. These are actual local um, tourism images that I pulled up that help us establish location. Um, so here's what happens when I add the multiply. So let's look at Gary here. So I've got a little red in his nose and some color in his face. And I've tinted the jacket. Notice the green glass. So we add fill. Oh my goodness! Well, that's quite dramatic, eh? Um, so notice in here what's happened with those tinted washes. So the shadows have now gotten a cast color that carries some of the characteristics of the light coming in the window, which is off to the uh, left of your screen here. Notice the leather in the jacket. The dark collar has become an interesting kind of blue. Here we've got the wood. I've just got a, a mustard color filling over. The same with the thing here and up there. Blue cable hanging down. I've dropped in a, 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 a wallpaper pattern. That's a pretty simple mask and drop effect. And then a color fill over it. It's kind of a dingy tavern look. I've got it in here on the walls. So here we go. See what's happened to her hair and his hair. So the end result, though, I like this combination because it kind of gives a almost a watercolory type of feel to the art, and I, it does suits me quite well. This is a very labor-intensive process, mostly in that I'm picky about the colors, the specific colors I use. So that's what took me so long. It would take me three or four days to draw one of these pages, and another two days to color it. And so a whole week for a page was just not reasonable. But I like the effect. So then here we've got, that's a, a cast for the glass, tinting color, and then a darker blue out here where it's open, and then light and reflective light here. And then this one, yeah, so this guy's foreground, shadow overlay. Here's the general shadow. So let's back up so we can see the whole thing. So now we're getting the lighting effects in. This is the light coming in from the window. I should rename that window. And so that gives us some more ambient, ambience and atmospheric effects. Uh, sort of lightens up the jacket here. It's an overlay, which is set to uh, normal. It could be set to lighten as well. That would work pretty much as well, the same. Um, it's usually what I use. And then I've got one more lighting effect here. It's for these pot lights in the bar. That's a very strong effect in this one, I believe. And notice the light effect in the lower panel, because it's backlit coming at us, so it's blowing out things a bit. Uh, I masked it. And now, again, I knocked it back, desaturated it. So you can see desaturated 12%. And so there's a couple reasons I do that. Um, one of the things people often get wrong about coloring digitally for print 
is they forget that uh, computers, digital coloring, it's backlit. The screen is backlit. And um, your print medium is printed onto paper. So the light's on front of the ink. So it's basically the difference of reflective versus projected color. Um, and reflected light versus projected light. Right now, if you're looking at your screen, I'm looking at my tablet here. I've got light coming from behind the LCD through the pixels at my eyes. So super saturated poppy bright colors look nice because they're backlit, they're bright. They, they glow like this red down here. Um, do I see if I've got a good... Oh yeah, there we go, there's a good example. Um, so the thing is, to get some of these colors, what you would, what you're doing is saturating them intensely, and that works fine with a pixel that's got light coming through it from behind. But when you, t we're talking about translating that to ink that goes, goes on the paper. The more saturated it is, that means you're more putting more ink on the paper. So the light's got to go th from the light source through the ink, hit the paper, back through the ink to your eye in order to be registered. And the more ink you put in the paper, the more saturated it is, the less light gets through. So, you know, there are some high-end luminous uh, pigments, inks, that are help improve this a bit in certain papers. But in the end, when it comes right down to it, if you oversaturate your print, you make a dark, muddy print. It might look wonderful on a computer monitor, but it looks muddy and kind of hard to read in print. So whenever I do a piece, I don't worry about it. You know, I make sure my, my monitor is reasonably calibrated, but I... Uh, in terms of getting the, the cast and hues about right. But uh, the main thing I'm concerned with is when I'm finished, once I've made myself happy, I knock it all about 15, in this case 12, but often like 15 to even 20 to 30% back in saturation. So like as much as this, even 50% actually sometimes. It depends on the job and the paper I'm using and the end result I want. Like I'm doing a Dracula book right now and I desaturate that at least 50%. Um, and uh, I think at least 50, we'll see in a second, I'm going to show you one of those pages. And uh, a lot of this all comes down to, I don't want the art to look too intensely uh, saturated on the print because it will be muddy. Uh, I sometimes will make a set for digital editions where I up the saturation so that it pops on screens, but I've actually come to like this look of this slightly knocked back effect. So that's why I do that. So there's another one. Let's close that one too. Yes. Enjoy your burger, dude. So here's another one from Dream Life. This one I wanted to show you for a couple of reasons. So here's the original art. Oops, there we go. Okay, and then I introduced some gradients for the lighting source. He's sitting in front of a computer monitor. Then I've got a layer set to color, tinting all of that. So let's take a look at the colors. You can see they're only 50%, so it's sort of subtle over the gradients. Now I've got uh, a 27% a multiply layer for the hair. A 55% multiply layer, more hair, and some colors on the bricks. Um, this is a big fill layer. But at this point, I felt like the colors were getting too overdone. Well, not quite that point. I created a bunch more. So these are shadows. That's a color cast on the shadow back here. So background, that's color, normal, soft light. That's the light filling his shirt, sort of making it pop. Here's some multiply shadows, strong shadows. And then I did some uh, dodging, basically, with vivid light over his face. But the end result was something that was just way too intensely poppy. So I did this purple mask. So let's make that, that's 52%. That's what it is. Just this purple mask, there's some lights in red and some slightly lighter purple on his face. 
and that goes over top of all of it to just harmonize the whole thing. You could also probably do this with a, a color overlay of a purple and set to a lighter, lighter percentage, but uh, I wanted to custom certain parts of it, so I did it this way. And that's to harmonize the colors. I was quite happy with the end result. In the end, I printed this in black and white, but I like this page. I um, feel like it has a nice ambience. So let's close that one. Do, 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 do. It's a big file. Very high resolution, actually, I think, if I recall. I was scanning these rather large because I wanted to blow them up. So here's our Dracula page, the last one in the set that I want to show you. And mainly because I do a lot of mucking around here. Uh, something I want to show you here because uh, in this particular project, I'm getting some help. So I have flats. In uh, uh, conception, concept art and uh, digital um, CGI work, uh, they call it clown colors. So it's basically a mask layer so that you can go in and select parts really easily. So I can just select that piece or that piece or that piece or I can do it by select all the mountaintops are the one color so I can do all the rocks and mountaintops and select and fill them at once. So I have that there but I have it turned off. So here's our line art. Let's get rid of that selection. Um, again this is one of those projects where I'm doing ink wash over line. I'm actually drawing it size as so it looks a little chunkier compared to my dream life work. Uh, a little larger than size is, but almost size is. It's on 9 by 12 paper for an 8 by 10 book. Let's get rid of those guides. Clear guides. We don't need those anymore. Um, and after I scanned it, I cleaned it up and I got rid of my my blues. And then I also uh, use hue uh, desaturation to just make it all gray. Get rid of all of the the tint in the washes. So then Becca, my flatter, is a talented colorist, uh, herself uh, did these for me from copies, the JPEGs of these that I sent to her. And that makes my life a lot easier. So I've also got, I'm doing a black and white version of this book and a color version of this book. So there's a black and white version of the art and it looks like this. That's all the stuff that's in the black and white book. So some of those are post, after I've done the black and white art, I do these little augmentations in Photoshop to enhance the work. So I've got a blood for the, the sunrise and breath coming off of Radu here and Vlad and the horse and some general vignetting effect. Uh, with a, a knockout here for the water in the gutter, so it'll glow. And that's good, and it's, the lettering goes over that, although this page has no lettering, so part of the reason I picked it, so it's nice and simple. And then I've got an overlay and multiply layer for the colors, but you'll also notice these, right? So I'll get to them in a second. So my overlay layer does this. And in some of the pages, that's all I use. I'm just tinting the gray tones with an overlay. But you can see some of these colors are a little funny because, again, I'm tinting with an eye towards, in many cases, the shadow color that has to do with the light source. So here's the multiply. Whoa, okay, so that's a whole other ball game, right? Suddenly he's purple and they've got orange pants and the horse is much more um, sort of horse colored. Some of the things like the rocks are a little super saturated and the sky is, is quite heavily tinted. Um, this is all designed to be uniformly desaturated and color shifted. So part of the design for Vlad is that uh, 
I wanted to have a period piece and it's a vampire book. So I've got this color balance layer. So notice I've got a color balance. You've got highlights, midtones, and shadows. Notice the red shift in each layer. So when I turn that on, this is what happens. A very warm, and we start getting much closer to the end result I want. But then I also pretty radically, 59% actually, desaturated. And I export these two layers onto every page of art in the book. So they all have the same treatment. So that's the end result there. Much more desaturated and color shifted. The the vignette the, the, the vintaging effect is pretty intense. And in some pages it really augments it when it gets things get bloody because of the red tint. It really makes the gory scenes quite gory. Um, but it does things like really knock back the blues in the sky there and generally feel very desaturated and, and old-timey. So these are, are my coloring tricks. This is how I do stuff, especially with all this uh, grayscale art that I do. Um, this stuff. A lot of my coloring is tailored to work with that. Oops. Get rid of the mask. There we go. So enjoy that. Again, this is not the process everyone uses. A lot of people will scan at higher resolutions and knock out the cut white and then put the line on top and all sorts of stuff. Um, there's one last thing that I want to mention, and it'll have to happen to these pages here in, on Dracula and anything that I go to print with. So it's called back and trapping. And when you're all done everything and you're ready to go to print, there's this little trick you want to do particularly for places like this. Um, now, Dracula's not going to need it so much because of the way I color it, but uh, it's not a bad idea to do it generally. So go to your line art. Let's turn off all this for a second. And, oops, all my lines back. There we go. And I got the magic wand, and I'm going to put the tolerance at around, uh, I think, uh, no, probably 30%. Let's see what that does. And I've got it non-continuous. I'm going to just click on the black here. So what I've done is selected all, what should be all the black lines. I'm just going to give it a quick inspection to make sure I'm not getting any gray values that are important. I don't see any. And I always do this just to check. Like, there's a lot in there that I might not want, but let's see what happens in a second. So that's pretty good. Now back in trapping guarantees that when you print this, so let's hide that for a second and bring back our colors. That um, you never end up with a weird splotchy black so that you see like, you, you'll see this sometimes where there's like a dark strong, especially with reds, a strong spot of red or blue in this area that you can see where the stylus, the the uh, This, you know, the brush circle overlapped, and there'll be shapes there in the black that are more glossy and black. And that's because there's more color and ink in that spot on top of the black ink. Um, and it hasn't been back and trapped. So back and trapping guarantees you nice, even blacks. So we've done this. We've selected all our blacks. We're in our black layer. You can do this on another layer or you can do it in your final art if you flatten all the art. You can do it in the flats when you're done. So what I usually do is go to Select, Modify, Contract. And then depending on the size of your pages and resolutions, I usually contract two to three pixels. So I think I'm going to do, because I'm doing working small with this book, and the lower resolution, we'll try two and see what that does. There you go. So I've got some holes here. I might go in and fill those. But the main thing we're looking for is, see how it's like, not going to be at risk of, say, filling in some of my smoke or the hair too much. I just want the areas where it's truly going to be supposed to be black or dark. And then 
what I usually do, so I'm going to do it on a new layer here, but I often just do this fill directly on the line art. But I'm going to do a new layer just so I can show it to you afterwards. Um, and I'm going to create a color. Now, this varies, but generally speaking, I usually do it around 65% for all three of the three colors in CYMK. Oops. 65%. Um, I've seen people do it at 80. I've seen people doing them all 100. That puts a lot of ink on the page. The main point here is to put a uniform tone in all these places, not make it the blackest, inkiest color you can. You can. So the 100% K and 65 of all of these. Now I'm working actually in RGB, so it's going to make a, a color actually an RGB for all of this. Um, but it'll be a pretty good approximation. Uh, you can also switch to RGB, uh, CYMK when you do this, but I actually uh, work in RGB quite often and have no problems with that. So, edit, fill, foreground color. So let's get rid of everything for a second so we can take a look at what we just added. So this is the back and trapping. And this is going to guarantee that all those places that are supposed to generally truly be black, genuinely truly be black, will be uniformly black. And this page has very little true blacks in it. But for a page where there was more, this becomes more significant. This is actually like a page where, given how little there is, I might not bother with this. But if you have a page with really big graphic areas of black, this becomes an important exercise. And that'll guarantee that things are nice and even in there. So let's take a quick look at up here and see what happens when we... So you can you can hardly even see it. There's a little bit of stuff in here in the hair that's going to affect. Um, but it'll actually probably make it more well defined. Let's see the horse's hair for a second. Barely notice it. So that's back and trapping. It's an old trick from way back in the days of classic graphic design and web printing but I do find it gives you slightly better results. Okay, that's it for my uh, coloring video. This has probably gone longer than I intended. Um, check out my Patreon at uh, patreon.com slash salgood. And uh, if you're in Montreal, you can take Making Comics at Sin Studio. So check out sinstudio.ca to register for classes there. We have a full program for concept art uh, with a lot of also a la carte classes for traditional plastic arts. And uh, uh, I do cartooning and making comics and dynamic drawing there. And I uh, will see you next time, internets. Uh, have fun and enjoy your art making. <laughs>